The Bob Murphy Show, episode 129. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. In this one, with whether I should even go down this path, but I think we've reached a point in our culture wars where uh, people saying things that are patently obvious are actually the heroes of the day. So for example, J.K. Rowling recently tweeted out that sex is real, meaning biological sex, and uh, people bit her head off for it, calling her a turf. And uh, more recently, Sam Harris on his podcast said a bunch of the statements that were mostly self-evident, and yet I remarked to my wife as we were listening to it that, wow, that's really courageous for him to say that stuff. I can see why he hesitated saying things about, you know, if you go and you're in a scuffle with a police officer, he's going to be worried that you might go for his gun. So if you don't want to get shot, don't get into a scuffle with a police officer. Things like that, which, you know, shouldn't be too controversial, and yet people bit his head off too. So with that sort of preamble, let me just explain what I'm going to be riffing on here. Uh, Nathan Tankus, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, it's T-A-N-K-U-S. He's on my radar because uh, he's one of the defenders of MMT, and he's clearly a self-taught person, like I, I could tell that just, you know, from before. Um, but, he, you know, very sharp guy, has a lot of facts at his disposal. He ends up endorsing MMT, so obviously he took a wrong turn somewhere in his reasoning. But, Sharp guy. And so anyway, he recently was featured in a piece for Bloomberg. And so here's like the, the Bloomberg tweet about the story. It says, credentials don't count on the internet. Just ask Nathan Tankus, 28, who hasn't finished his bachelor's degree, but has a paid newsletter on the Federal Reserve called Notes on the Crisis, right? And so it's a puff piece on this guy, Nathan, and just basically, you know, talking about, look at this, the kid's or the guy is able to get a paid newsletter, even though he's largely self-taught, right? So that's the thing. So the reason this issue sort of blew up beyond just a, you know, oh, that's nice, and this geeky kid does well for himself, and ah, MMT, how about that? It, It got bigger than that because Nathan took the opportunity when this story ran to post a thread that a lot of people I saw referring to as an anti-racist thread. And so you're like, what does that mean? And so here, let me just read some of these tweets from Nathan as he's responding to this, you know, featured article on him coming out in Bloomberg. So Nathan says, I really appreciate this very, very generous profile from Peter Coy, but I do want to disagree with the headline, which is reinforced by the article. I do have a credential. And then he's got like a dash. The intersection of my whiteness, maleness, and cisness. Okay, so just in case you're getting lost what Nathan is saying is he appreciates this nice piece that Bloomberg, you know, Peter Coy of Bloomberg did on him, but the title and the blurb in the article, the the main hook was, hey, everybody, look at this guy, Nathan Tankis. He didn't even finish his bachelor's degree. He's got no credentials. And yet in this day and age on the internet, he was able to inculcate a following and he even makes a living now writing a newsletter on the Federal Reserve, even though... He's got no credentials. How about that? What an, what an age we live in. And so Nathan is disagreeing and saying, no, 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 it's not true. Though I appreciate the gesture, it's not true that I have no credentials. My credentials are, and then just to repeat, he said, the intersection of my whiteness, maleness, and cisness. And cisness means like someone who's cisgender, in case you don't, aren't familiar with that term. Okay, so now I'm going to just keep uh, quickly reading some of Nathan's tweets here in this thread that I'm a white cis male who dresses in dress shirts and dress slacks and have done so since I was 19, in parentheses, has given me a passport into conferences, events, and more. I crashed conferences without paying during high school that I would have been barred from if I looked any other way. In 2010, I attended a mainstream economics PhD students conference 
where students presented their job market papers and I asked basic questions about their assumptions and methodology. That would not have been tolerated if I didn't have all those, quote, credentials. Again, meaning that he was white male and cis and could wear dress slacks. In fact, this is precisely why marginalized people, especially black people, black is with a capital B, get educational credentials. They need them to be taken as seriously, and sometimes still less seriously, as I am without educational credentials. See the works of people like, and then he gives a bunch of Twitter handles to various people who, I guess, have written on this issue. I also benefit from people, in a sense, quote, lending me their credentials when they promote my work. I doubt this would have happened as easily as it has if I were anything but a cis white man. And now he does, you know, try to diffuse some of the objections to what he's saying here. This isn't to bemoan or disclaim my success or my hard work. The point is, there are plenty of people who have worked just as hard as me, and many harder than me, who aren't having the success I am. It takes my social credentials to take a glide path to the most interesting and advanced subjects. It is my, quote, ethnographic experience with my social credentials, referred to as privileges, that makes me support initiatives like, and then he links to uh, diversifying and decolonizing economics, which is a Twitter account, which is looking to change the social hierarchy of economics and hopefully devalue my social credentials within it. Okay, and then he ends the thread by giving a bunch of links to other people that he thinks we ought to be following who don't have his ethnographic credentials and so they need this boost from somebody like him. Okay, so there's the thread. That's the thrust of it. So, geez, Bob, what's your problem? Okay, so the most important thing I want to mention on this topic and the, re and the reason that I decided to cover it is I think if you're older, and I don't mean like... An old man back in my day. We thought a colorblind society was great and we loved it. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying even just if you're 30 or older, well, let's say 35, how about that? You might not realize just how rampant it is now in schools that people are taught matter of factly if you are white, male, heterosexual, and cisgender. And by the way, the reason Nathan didn't say that is I, I think he's... In really, he, has, he refers to his boyfriend later on, so that's why he didn't mention that other credential. So he was able to get through with only three of them. Um, that that there's that you know there's something terribly wrong with you that you're part of a group that is responsible for all of the evils in today's world. And what's even more insidious, they acknowledge that oh no, it's not that you personally did anything, right? So there's nothing you can do about it, right? It'd be one thing if it was just hey, everybody, watch what you say. You might be subconsciously uh, engaging in bigotry against people or maybe you tell a joke that you don't think is offensive, but you know, somebody, a person of color who hears that joke, they might take offense and say, why don't you think about it from their perspective and that maybe you should change. No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying the mere fact that you were born with your DNA means you are institutionally guilty, period, regardless of your behavior. And you should feel bad about that, right? And if you think I'm exaggerating, I promise you I'm not. Um, this was on my radar, like in a somewhat personal way, at least through hearsay. A few years ago, my wife had gone back to undergrad and she was, you know, just telling me that in one of her classes, the, the, there was an opening exercise, kind of an icebreaker to start the semester where each kid was going to get up, each student was going to get up and you know, tell, it was like, you know, tell us two facts about yourself, you know, that, that kind of a thing just to get the kids talking and whatever. And, uh, and she said, this one guy got up there who was, you know, white and male and he spread out the bat was like kind of dejected and was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm white and male. So, I mean, that's not good, but, but I guess, uh, you know, facts about myself. And then he, you know, said whatever he, whatever it was, what he's into basketball or whatever, like to go fishing. And the thing that astonished, astonished me about that when she was telling me that, my wife was telling me this anecdote, was not merely that the kid got up there and that's what he thought to say, but that the class and the teacher didn't say like, oh, no, I mean, come on, don't, don't feel bad about it. You can't help how you were born. I mean, that's just, no, it was just like, mm -hmm, yep, you, you, you're right. That is, that is a strike against you. And, you know, maybe you can spend your life trying to dig out of that hole because you were born a white male. All right. And again, if, if you haven't been on college campuses or been talking with people who are connected to it, you might think I'm exaggerating or you might think like, oh, that's just some crazy, what is that, UC Berkeley or something you're talking about, Murphy? No, this is standard stuff at this point, okay? And, and again, the transition, I don't know exactly when this 
me think it's probably somewhat of a gradual thing, but my point being, if you went through the educational system and got out more than 10 plus years ago, I think you got through without this being so pervasive. So when you hear this kind of stuff, it bounces off you. You can step back and be like, well, let's see, we're going to condemn a group of people because of their skin color. What was the, what's the term? There's a word. Oh yeah. Racism. That's what that is. That's racist. If you condemn people because of their skin color. So we wouldn't do that. Right. Cause again, we're ostensibly again. And I'm saying, no, no, no. The rules have changed over time. Now, if you say that they will laugh and dismiss you as being completely out of touch because literally the, the the definition of racism has changed, right? So for example, you know, Martin Luther King type speech of a colorblind society where people are judged on the basis of their character and their actions, not the color of their skin. It's, that's no longer the ideal, right? That, it's not as if that's held up and people say, ah, in practice, we, we fall short of that, but we're still, str-. no, no, no. That has long since been jettisoned. Okay. It's, we're at a point now where it is literally impossible for a person of color to be racist, okay? That the, the, what, what we mean now by racism is tied to power and institutional structures. Now, what's funny is even on its own terms, there's institutional anti-white racism. Like I say, like it's, it's not just that, oh, there's one teacher who happened to be against white people and this kid picked up on the vibe. No, I mean, this is part of the curriculum at this point, right? So this is institutionalized. So if it's racism... If you agree with me that, you know, telling people because you're white, you should feel bad about yourself because you're bad. If you call that racism, then it already is institutionalized racism too, because it's part of the, the structure of the educational system at this point, not to mention the broader culture, media and so forth. Okay. So in, in case you were blissfully unaware of that, I'm, I'm letting you know. And again, I, I, there were other things I, I've known just in my personal life through anecdotes and whatnot that young people going through that, I might have thought, oh yeah, I mean, surely they have self-esteem and they know that they didn't, you know, they're not responsible for something that happened 200 years. No, 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 they don't. They pick up on that vibe when you have, you know, imagine that. Just like when we're educated on how bad slavery and Jim Crow and stuff was, when people grow up in a culture where they're constantly told day in and day out from various sources, including their teachers, the TV and so on, that if they happen to have these characteristics in terms of their ethnic background, that they are guilty of the worst sins of humanity, that actually gets under people's skin and starts to make them feel bad about themselves. Imagine that, okay? And again, uh, this, this has been driven home to me in a very real way by people I know. All right. So that's the main thing I wanted to, to get across. But now let's go ahead and, and do some analysis to give you more bang for your buck if you're one of the contributors. So what's interesting to me about Nathan Tankus's thread, it's, there's a sense in which he's right, okay? So there's, there's two different ways you can respond to that. One way is you could say, what? That's not, that's not right, Nathan. There was, there's no privileges there. And, you know, I do tend to think, I mean, so he's certainly right about being dressed up. That's certainly true. If you showed up at a, at a conference where they were going to have economists get up and give job talks and somebody from the outside wanted to just come in and say, hey, is it all right if I just take a seat and maybe ask a question in the Q&A period? And the person, you know, was homeless or something or, or dressed as if he were and had strong body odor. That's right. Somebody would think, that guy doesn't belong here and would ask him, um, can I help you? And would basically ask him to leave. But if it were just somebody totally dressed up in nice slacks or whatever and had black skin, would they be asked to leave? And again, Nathan's 28 right now. So we're talking, what, the year 2010 that he would have been going to these conferences and whatever. You're telling me in 2010, institutionally, it was the case that economists didn't like black people sitting in their seminars? Give me a break. This is, this is crazy. All right, so Nathan is wrong for saying that uh, in the strong form, okay? Um, but, okay, there's a sense in which, yes, he does have certain advantages and he wants to call them privileges or, or credentials, okay. But look at all the things he left out, right? He's making it sound like, ah, the three really important things that this Bloomberg writer missed about me to show that actually I do have advantages that helps explain how I got to where I am are that I'm male, white, and cisgender. And I would say, okay, there's a lot of other things too that he left out. For example, imagine if Nathan had been born blind, right? I just technically, I don't know that he is sighted, but I think he is. 
there's obviously when you look at his picture, there's nothing physically wrong with his eyes. All right. So if he had been born blind or if he had been in an accident and lost his sight at age five, I'm guessing he wouldn't be where he is right now. So that's a huge bullet that he dodged, right? There are people in this world who can't see and that is a huge disadvantage to them. It's not a deal breaker, but it's certainly a disadvantage. Okay. Uh, Nathan could have been in an accident and gotten brain damage. He, you know, okay. He could have been born in another country that was relatively poor, where he wouldn't have had the freedom in the spare time to devote to going to economics conferences, crashing them and asking people about, well, gee, I don't see how you got your P star there and on that third last PowerPoint slide, right? Because you'd be too busy out in the fields or in the factory trying to raise enough money so your family, your siblings didn't starve. Okay, so that is a huge advantage Nathan has for being born in the United States in this time period. And I'm guessing coming from at least a middle class background so that he has time to throw on his dress slacks and go to these conferences. All right. Um, you know, it's a good thing Nathan didn't get killed by one of Obama's drone strikes, right? That's, whew, that would have certainly stopped his career in its tracks, right? All right? So there's all sorts of things you could list as to advantages or privileges or sheer good luck that has nothing to do with his merit that explains how did Nathan end up where he is right now. And so it's very arbitrary and it's clearly just a result of U.S. politics and culture war that he happened to pick those three attributes. There's all kinds of statements about Nathan's background we could make besides just his hard work and merit and his intelligence that explains how he got to where he is. And so if he wants to, you know, have his blessing or, or be, count his blessings and, and be real humble. So keep in mind, I'm, I'm glad he's being humble, right? Certainly as a Christian, I think we should all reflect on the fact that the stuff we have is not through our own merit, but, you know, a gift from God, the, the good things in our lives. And you should be grateful about that, right? It's not that happy people are grateful, but grateful people are happy. So that's all true. So don't misunderstand. My point is not to say, Nathan, what are you doing? Take credit for your actions. Stop being such a spoiled winner. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the three things he happened to focus on to show why, oh, actually, I don't deserve this, this label uncredentialed because I had these. I'm saying there's lots of, quote, credentials if he wants to go down that path. And yet he didn't go down that path. Okay, so, or another way of putting it is every single person on earth who has anything could stop and reflect and say, there's a sense in which I didn't earn this purely through my own merits. And again, if you're a believer, you'd say, yeah, it's because this is, and all these blessings are ultimately coming from the generosity of God. All right. And so that's not a coincidence and it's not accidental and it's, it has implications that he happened to select those three. I mean, it's a good thing Nathan isn't growing up in Yemen right now where, you know, the U.S. government's policies have helped contribute to that terrible war that's going on with Saudi Arabia. That's a good thing. He didn't grow up there. All right, but if we focused on that sort of stuff, then that might lead us to different political conclusions, whereas people love Nathan's thread because he happened to list those. I mean, you, know, you could, if you wanted to be a jerk about it, you'd be like, it's a good thing he wasn't aborted. Whew. He dodged a bullet, right? I mean, we could play this game all day, to reinforce whatever our political conclusion we want it to be. Whew, it's, a good, it's a good thing, uh, you know, they didn't cross Bill Clinton, right? And Hillary Clinton. Okay, so let me now broaden the discussion and not merely talk about Nathan's thread and the narrowness of the topic. Let me open it up a little bit. So this issue of, G right now, should white male cisgender people feel bad about that fact. And let me, let me just make a distinction. It's one thing if you're a person, let's say of privilege, let's go ahead and call it that. And you don't fully appreciate the suffering of others in your society and you largely keep your mouth shut. Okay. So I, I agree with, I understand and agree with that notion, right? That, uh, but, but again, notice I'm saying, why are we focusing so narrowly on the particular marginalized groups and victims that somebody like Nathan Tankus wants us to focus on? Because they're by far not the, the worst off on earth, right? So somebody who um, doesn't get into an economics conference in the United States 
because somebody thinks, oh, wait a minute, this guy doesn't belong here. And by the way, that's what Nathan is getting at is it's, he, I, I recognize he's not saying that they have an explicitly anti uh, minority sign posted at these things. He's saying, Nathan is saying he was able to slip. He actually wasn't supposed to be there, but he's saying they let it slide because he looked like he belonged, right? So I, I get that nuance to his argument. So if other people had been excluded who didn't have his quote credentials, it's not because there would be institutionally a policy against letting in somebody who's black to an economics conference. His point was the person might stick out more. And so the organizer might walk over and say, uh, excuse me, uh, young man, can I help you? Uh, and then the person would say, oh, no, I, I'm not registered. I just thought I'd come in. And they might say, well, yeah, we appreciate that. But you did. that's what Nathan means. Okay, so I'm saying in the grand scheme, if you look at all the injustice that's happening on planet Earth, including the fact that slavery has literally been reintroduced in Libya, somewhat related to U.S. foreign policy, not entirely, but you know, you could, you could make a connection there, that there's literally slavery in certain parts of the world right now. And Nathan wants us to focus on the fact that someone who's black couldn't sneak into an economics conference, that they would have to actually be registered to be allowed to go to it in the United States. So is, is, is that really you know, the, the most pressing thing right now? Is that what we need to be shaking the American public and saying, wake up, folks. Do you understand that some people can't just walk into an economics conference without paying their dues and being registered? Or is it like the horrors of U.S. foreign policy, for example? All right. So again, my point being, I'm perfectly fine to say the American people are too busy watching TV and drinking beer and da 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 to notice what's going on. And that's largely what I do with my career is I try to show people, hey, do you see how bad our system is right now? And you, and you see the horrors that it produces and you realize what a better world we could live in if we didn't have institutionalized coercion. Okay, so Nathan and I are on the same page in terms of that. It's just he's picking a much narrower issue. And in fact, on some of his stuff, I think he's just misguided that he's misdiagnosing what the problem is. And certainly what I take to be his solutions would often make things worse, at least to the extent that if he wants government to be involved. All right. Now, along these lines, it's obvious, you know, an obvious first retort would be for somebody to say, what are you guys talking about? You know, you look at the 10 year old kid who happens to be white. He didn't own slaves. His parents didn't own slaves. In fact, maybe his, his family immigrated to the United States in 1880. So clearly they have nothing to do with this. So, so how could they possibly, right? And so the response is from the people like, and this ties in like to the rep reparations argument and stuff like that. But the idea that existing white people in the United States right now have this privilege and they've benefited from the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow and so on, even if they personally haven't gone out and told racist jokes or discriminated in their hiring decisions or whatnot, Nope, they're still guilty because they've benefited from this thing and they need to have their awareness raised and so on. The type of response they're going to get is to say they still have benefited economically, right? And people will point to statistics about wealth distribution and whatnot. You know, oh, the average white family right now has such and such an assets compared to the average black family. And that's prima facie evidence that they've benefited from the past um, existence of slavery and, and other forms of exploitation. Okay, so I'm not going to rehash the argument too deeply here in this episode, but the economics there is just wrong, all right? That, yes, certain groups of white people back in the 1800s did financially benefit from the existence of slavery, but the average white person in the United States was made poorer by the institution of slavery. So certainly the average black person was made poorer too, but the average white person was poor also. You say, well, how can that be? But because slavery is a very inefficient system. Not only is it immoral, but it's inefficient, okay? That you take a given society with a given people, you know, of various colors, and if one group enslaves the other, the total output of that group of people is lower, okay? And there's various reasons for that. Two obvious ones when there's slavery, you have to devote resources to containing the slaves, right? You have to have patrols. You got to, you know, ha house them in certain things. You got to, uh, you know, de devote 
certain people, like their job is just to be law enforcement and go catch runaway slaves and stuff like that. Also, you have to do things like not educate your slaves too much, right? So in the South, you know, there were codes against teaching your slaves how to read. Because you think about it, that would make sense. Other things equal, it helps you if you own other human beings for them to have more skills, right? Because then they're more productive. They're more useful to you as the, as the owner. But yet there were government codes, at least in certain areas of the South, prohibiting a master from teaching his slave how to read because the fear was, oh, wait a minute, if these slaves learn how to read, then they're going to get funny ideas in their head and they might, you know, that might lead to an uprising or it might just help them plot against the system. Okay, so there, were, there was government intervention interfering with the right of private property owners to do what they wanted with their property. All right, so, uh, oh, and then the other main way to see it is if you're a slave, you don't have any interest in boosting your output. Your interest is in doing the bare minimum to avoid punishment. Whereas if you're free, then you do have the incentive to improve your abilities to look around to see what opportunities are there. Oh, gee, if I move over, you know, if we move to this city over here, maybe I can double my salary. Da, da, da. So the productivity of the slaves would be much higher, especially if, as you let the clock run, if they were free. Okay, so again, the argument is, if you, for example, if you started out with a society that had institutionalized slavery and then you just magically turned it off, I'm saying the total output per capita output would be much higher from that whole nation, especially if you waited five, 10 years and checked in again compared to the counterfactual if you maintain slavery. Now, the distribution would be different too, right? So the only way it's possible that the existence of slavery makes the non slaves richer is if even though total output is lower because the slaves get so much of their share taken from them that for the non-slave class even though total output's lower they get a bigger proportion of the smaller pie such that their piece is still bigger in absolute terms right so that's that's logically possible i'm just saying empirically i don't think that it is what actually happens okay so like I say, I, I went over that. I made the case in a, in a solo episode and then I had other economists on and we talked about the, uh, the economics of slavery. So I'll link to all those in the show notes page. This is bobmurphyshow.com slash 129 if you want to see links to some of that earlier discussion for me to flesh that out. But if you, for the moment, for the sake of argument, understand what I'm saying, notice that's deadly to the case for reparations right? Because the, the case for that or the case for saying people right now who are, you know, white have this institutionalized legacy and they benefited from it, even if you personally didn't do anything or your grandfather didn't personally do anything obnoxious or abhorrent, you still have benefited from this. And so you owe somebody else something. I'm saying, no, actually, if what I just said is true, then in general, even white people walking around in the United States are poorer than they otherwise would have been that there was less wealth that was created and handed down through the generations than otherwise would have been the case. So far, so the, the proponents of reparations and just more generally, you know, this guilt associated with being privileged in, in U.S. society today, what they're sort of thinking of it as, as if there were a stagecoach or, or let's say a house that back in 1860, there was a house that some white people stole from somebody and then they kept handing it down to their kids and their grandkids and so on. And so today, the person who inherited that house is thinking, what, I didn't do it, what, just my, my dad gave me this house, what are we talking about? I didn't steal it from it. But if you went back and traced it through the generations, ah, see, no, 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 your great, great, great grandfather actually did steal it from somebody, so you owe it to that person's descendants and we could figure out who it is. So incidentally, Walter Block, the libertarian theorist, is fine with that. So he's not against reparations due to slavery per se, his point is just you actually have to go prove it. It can't just be this, you know, kind of abstract, well, all white people owe some portion. He's saying, no, you go and you got to trace it. If you can go find historical examples of theft and then trace it down through the lineage and show the people who right now are walking around with extra wealth because of that episode or because of, you know, those practices, specific ones, and then you can figure out who otherwise would have inherited that stuff, then he's okay with that. I'll see if I can find an article on that and link to it. Okay, he, but his point is just, 
it can't just be some you know government policy right now that oh there's going to be a tax on white people because of slavery because that's too open ended that that you're not tying into spe- a specific act of theft and then you know passing that down okay so that's that's the argument again if that's the the way we're thinking about it okay again there's nothing in principle wrong with that it's just difficult in practice and it might be unwise to open those floodgates because you're not going to be able to limit it to legitimate cases but even on its own terms that whole enterprise collapses if i happen to be right when i say institutionalized slavery makes a society much poorer than it otherwise would be such that even the non-slaves on average are worse off okay and what's ironic about all this stuff is partly why i'm personally so sure that what i'm saying is true is i know how bad slavery is besides just being immoral it's a stupid system it's completely in- inefficient right it i or going the other way i understand the explosion of innovation and productivity and creativity that would happen when you free people from bondage so it's weird to me that here i am the stodgy right wing conservative who's having to explain to people just how crippling economically slavery is or another way of putting it partly why the north was so able to defeat the south in the civil war or the war between the states if you want to call it that is because the north was based on free labor right so again it's not just a coincidence that the north had more industrial might i'm saying it's partly because the north was a system based on free labor whereas the south wasn't and so we shouldn't be surprised that the north was able to produce more material for a war so again it's weird to me that the people whose careers are more devoted to being you know against slavery and its legacy and whatever in order for their case to go through they have to say oh actually slavery was a productive system and yeah a society based on slavery does pretty well for itself it's just you know it happens to be immoral but you know that's really the only strike against it and i want to say no that that's it's so destructive even in material terms that a society instituting slavery cripples itself you know looking at another way right now if the us were to reintroduce slavery are we saying that the average white person would be richer because of that in 5 years no that that's that's crazy to think that and you're not thinking it through if i would submit if you disagree with me on that point hey folks let's take a pause from the discussion to mention why you should contribute to the bob murphy show i don't want to do ads i think that would change the flavor of the podcast and so i rely on support directly provided by you the listener and so i'm going to ask you if you like the show the content i provide and you haven't done so already why don't you uh give it a whirl go to bobmurphyshow.com/contribute and thanks for listening okay so just further thoughts along these lines even if we were going to go ahead and institutionalize this and we were to say that oh by definition in today's world like it doesn't even make sense to say that oh black people who engage in certain activities they can't be racist because they don't have power right and again i'm saying that's what the thing is like reverse racism is not even a thing they're not merely saying empirically it's rare or that in the grand scheme that's so insignificant compared to the white on black racism historically that let's not even worry about it. that's not what they're saying the most hardcore activists are saying by definition it is impossible for current uh groups who are marginalized to engage in racism or what's called reverse racism because it's now been tied to power. And I say okay, even if we grant that, then at what point does that flip? Okay, so let's say we have these policies in place, things that like Nathan Tankus wants where the current groups of, you know, people in power go out of their way to elevate others. And I didn't read those quotes, but Nathan at the end that's what he summed up by saying, okay, well, at some point presumably that would work, right? I mean, I I would like to think the people advocating these measures think at some point they would be successful right that they think this is actually moving us towards a society where these injustices don't exist or at least are m- very rare okay so i've never seen a discussion of at what point would it be possible for you know a black transgender person to oppress somebody else right cuz right now it's literally impossible according to their framework but if we have these measures in place that are supposed to rectify these imbalances to elevate the people who currently don't have a voice 
I'm saying, okay, if that works, then at some point down the road, they should have equal standing with other people, white male, cisgender people. And so at that point, it would be possible for them to, you know, exercise discrimination when they go to hire people, right? Some black trans guy is running a business and doesn't hire cis people as a matter of policy. And that's, that's unfair discrimination. And so I'm saying, at what point do we flip and do we say, okay, now everybody's relatively equal in power. And so now everybody has the ability to be a racist or to be a bigot, whereas right now that's impossible. And I've never seen a discussion of that. It's just always, no, it's impossible right now. Quit your belly aching. Stop quoting Dr. Martin Luther King's speech, you uh, person filled with hate. All right, because clearly at some point, if their plan is to succeed, that would be possible, right? And again, I've just, I've never seen an example. Or I guess a different way of phrasing it is what I'm saying is the best long-term solution to the, the past legacy of systematic discrimination is to stop discriminating against people, right? If, if we all agree that, that it was horrible that in the past, like someone who was born black in the United States was treated differently in an inferior way because of the color of their skin and people had all sorts of assumptions about them and how they were criminals and blah, blah, blah because of the color of their skin. I'm saying the best way to get out of that framework and to deal with it is going forward to not judge people on the basis of their skin color as opposed to let's just flip it and assume people who are white are automatically guilty and should be penalized institutionally. And, and then I guess what, at some point, then we're going to turn the dial back to zero, but not yet. I'm saying, no, that's, that's actually a very poor, unwise decision that in my book, you're just exchanging one group of sins for another. And so that doesn't undo the, the past ones. That just causes fresh wounds. But even if you thought that that wasn't true, still at some point you'd have to turn it off. And what are the chances of that? All right, so it's sort of like the, the right wing's war on terror. That's open-ended. They will never stop that. They will never get to a point where they say, okay, now we stop. So you can see partly the danger in that rhetoric and going down that path. Besides the particular, you know, oh, do I agree with the invasion of Afghanistan or Iraq? But to brand it as a war on terror, as the right neoconservative right did, you can see why that was a very dangerous move because they're never going to turn that off. And so I'm saying likewise here, even if you think, no, 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 at least for the next 20 years, it's fine to openly, quote, discriminate against white people because we're rectifying the past. I'm saying, well, what, how would you ever turn that off once that infrastructure gets built up? Okay, let me just mention a few other points here in terms of the economics of this stuff because, again, it's partly this this viewpoint by the way i'm under no illusions that this is driven by economic analysis this stuff is clearly about power politics and the rhetoric i think is chosen in order to just bolster the power grab of certain activist groups but since the masses who might endorse these views might be led to endorse them partly because of economic considerations let me try to pull out the foundations from them so we already talked about slavery. What about apartheid, right? And I've been hearing about that lately. Just watched a good movie with the kid from Harry Potter starting it. It's a good movie uh, about apartheid in South Africa. And so let's say, you know, a, a law that mandates that, oh, in certain areas, there can only be um, white business owners and for certain jobs, they can only hire white applicants. Okay, so that's one manifestation. That's one example of the whole system that in South Africa was called apartheid. Okay, so clearly that hurts black people, no doubt about it. But notice, it also hurts some white people. Okay, and that's the thing. Like people are thinking, oh yeah, the apartheid system hurt blacks and helped the, the white minority. And I'm saying, no, it actually didn't. Or at least it's not nearly as obvious as you think it is. So for example, again, that particular example, there's a law in place that says, White business owners, at least for certain categories and certain locations, they can only hire white job applicants. We're setting aside these jobs for white people. Yes, that certainly hurts qualified black people who could work in those jobs, but it also hurts the business owner by taking away his options or her options, right? So if you're a white business owner and you have two job applicants for a position, and let's say they could both do it, they're both qualified. Back then, presumably what would happen is the white candidate would demand a higher salary, 
or command one because he has other options, whereas the black candidate would be willing to work for less. And so if the law says you are not allowed to hire the black candidate, even though the business owner otherwise would have wanted to, he's out that difference in pay, right? He has to pay more than he otherwise would have needed to. So that hurts him. Think of it this way. If no business owner is changing his behavior, then the law is, is empty, right? You don't need to have a law in the books if everybody would do that behavior anyway. So the point of having an apartheid system backed up by laws is that it keeps business owners from violating, you know, the, uh, the racist policy. So again, the point being in that example, if the law compels a white business owner to hire a white candidate for a certain job, yes, that hurts the black applicant, but it also hurts the white business owner. So again, the point being, it's not obvious or it's much more nuanced when you say, ah, yes, this system impoverished the, uh, the black majority and enriched the white minority. I'm saying, no, it's much more sophisticated than that. And I would also argue in the long run, especially it made everybody poorer than otherwise would be the case. Now, let me just plug a hole in the argument here. You might say, well, geez, if it's so stupid, Bob, and it's so inefficient, then why did we have it at all? Right. But that's unfortunately true for a lot of stuff, right? Like the minimum wage law is dumb. It only helps a certain, you know, certain high skilled workers by keeping out low skilled competition. It certainly hurts low skilled laborers and it makes the mass of consumers poor and it hurts the, the business owner, forces them to pay higher wages than they otherwise would have to. So you might say, well, gee, why do we have minimum wage laws? Well, because most people aren't aware of the stuff that I just said. All right. So I'm not saying that all of the white people in the United States in 1850 or in South Africa during the height of apartheid understood that it was impoverishing them on average. They probably thought it was good. And also too, people care about things besides just GDP, right? You can imagine some people might have admitted, oh yeah. And that's probably the way they would have justified imposing restrictions on what business owners do, even though they had the same skin color as the politicians. They say, oh yeah, you're throwing out considerations of culture and what makes this nation's you know, great in our heritage in order just to, because you're, you know, going after the bottom line. You're chasing pennies and throwing away our culture. You can imagine they would be talking like that, All right? But again, <laughs> my point being, notice there, if that's the argument they would use, and I think they would have pushed, they're conceding that, yes, our policies are hampering economic productivity, and they would have to switch to some other criteria and say, well, there's more to life than just GDP, or they probably would have said GNP back then. All right. So again, just thinking through this stuff, it's not nearly the open and shut case that advocates of reparations or uh, those concerned about the privileges of white America would have you believe. Let me give you a different example. So my wife and I were watching this other documentary because we were you know, trying to see things from the other side and they brought up the pay gap. So this was a, you know, a progressive thing that thinks Donald Trump is the vanguard of resurgence of the, uh, you know, white nationalism in the United States, that kind of thing. This is the kind of documentary it was. And they brought up the pay gap and they were showing how, you know, a woman earns whatever, I think they said 80 cents to the man's dollar in the United States. And then they were adjusting and showing if, you know, a woman of color, da, 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 and it was even bigger disparities. And then they said, and, you know, the starkest illustration of this is with the U.S. women's soccer team. So even though the U.S. women's soccer team, you know, did awesome internationally, Still, they got paid, and I don't remember what the statistic was, but they got paid less than the men's soccer team, even though the women did much better. You know, they were champs, you know, in their competition, in their arena, and the men didn't do so hot, okay? So that, you know, and, that, and that's true, that the U.S. women's soccer, that team is much more competitive on an international arena than the men's soccer team is. Okay, and therefore, the fact that the women get paid less than the men do is prima facie evidence of sexism and anti-female bigotry in the United States. That, that was the point of the documentary. Okay, so a couple things. Number one, does anyone doubt that if the women's team played the men's team, they would get destroyed? Okay, so I think that's, that's worth pointing out. And you say, well, we don't know. No, no, we do know. Because here I'm reading in April 2017, the women's national team played... FC Dallas under 15 boys and the under 15 boys beat them 
five to two. Okay, let me read a little bit from this CBS article. In preparation for two upcoming friendlies against Russia, I guess that means a, uh, a friendly match, the U.S. women's national team played the FC Dallas under-15 boys academy team on Sunday and fell 5-2, to two, according to FC Dallas's official website. This friendly came as the U.S. looked to tune up before taking on Russia on Thursday night in a friendly. Just a, okay. And then he says, or then the writer says, of course, this match against the academy team was very informal and should not be a major cause for alarm. The U.S. surely wasn't going all out, with the main goal being to get some minutes on the pitch, build chemistry when it comes to moving the ball around, improve defensive shape, and get ready for Russia. The game will, however, serve as a great anecdote for the kids on the FC Dallas squad to tell their grandchildren about one day. It also speaks highly of the level of academy development MLS teams are doing these days. Okay, and then they have like nice selfies that the people took with, that you know, the, the under-15 boys took with the women's national team. Okay, so, you know, it, it was just funny to me how the CBS story was spinning it, like not just pointing out that, huh, that's kind of funny that, you know, our premier team lost to a bunch of teenage boys, all right? And, and they're trying to say, well, they didn't go all out. Yeah, right, that's true. But I think if an NBA team or, you know, the, the Olympic dream team basketball played under 15 boys in basketball, I'm pretty sure those men would have crushed those boys, even if they weren't given it their all. Pretty sure... Charles Barkley, even given it 50%, would have held his own against 14-year-olds, okay? So th this is, you know, and, and this is obvious, right? Anybody who knows about this kind of stuff, like it's clear, of course, men are better than women at soccer, other things equal, all right? So, and by the way, I'm not trying to diminish, like for example, when you ask who's the best physicist of all time, well, there's a sense in which I'm a better physicist than Isaac Newton. I know more physics than he does. Clearly, he's a way better physicist than me, right? Because you have to judge them relative to their peers. Or when we say, you know, Babe Ruth, how is he as a baseball player compared to Pete Rose or something? I mean, you, you don't just take them and then put them against each other head to head because that's kind of unfair. You got to look at, you know, well, who are they playing against? How, how do they stand out against their competitors? So by that token, yes, it's fine to say the women's soccer, U.S. women's soccer team is more impressive than the men's soccer team. I'm, I'm fine with saying that, but I also just want to mention because I think in our day and age, again, J.K. Rowling gets in trouble for saying sex is real, that let's, when we're forming these discussions and saying, oh, the women get paid less for the same job. I want to say, well, no, on this one, if it were the same job, meaning you know, any objective measurement of soccer ability, clearly the men's team is better. And, and then that's partly why you know, so the real explanation, why do the men get paid more? Because more people watch men's soccer than women's. That's a bigger thing. And so there's more advertising dollars available. That's the reason. And so then though I'm saying, if you want to push it back a level and say, okay, but why are the viewers so sexist and discriminatory? I say, because it's more fun to watch men playing because they're better soccer players. All right. I've, I went to, when I was in Chicago, I took my son, we went to the local soccer match, you know, the, the women's one. and and they weren't as good as male athletes. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. So it, it was, in some respects, it was an interesting game to watch because they had to focus on different, you know, it wasn't just raw individual talent. Like it was more like the playing as a team and whatever. So it's kind of like some people prefer watching college football to the NFL. But nonetheless, when I first got there, I was like, oh, these women are like, you know, I know guys when I used to play travel soccer, like in high school, these women are, like each of them is, about as good as the best players in that league when I was a teenager. That's kind of what my assessment was. So yeah, they were better than me. And if they had played our team when I was in high school, it would have been a close match. But when I go and watch an NBA game or, <laughs> or a major league baseball game, I'm not thinking, yeah, these guys are about as good as my, the best kids I knew playing, you know, back in high school. No, no, no. It's like, wow, these guys are professional athletes. This is amazing. They do this for a living. They're doing stuff that I couldn't dream of doing. All right. Um, the other thing too that's funny about that is the, I think partly what that shows, the fact that the U.S. men's team is not nearly as competitive against like Europe or South America teams as the women's team. I think that shows how progressive the United States is. It shows that our girls are encouraged and allowed to play soccer at a young age and our programs are as advanced is those in Europe and other countries where soccer is a much bigger deal. 
And I would say that shows that, you know, that's one respect in which the United States is very progressive. And yet that evidence is being used to condemn America and show how sexist we are. Another thing along these lines, I was going to toy with just to show how goofy these statistics were and try to come up with something like, you know, look at the average black athlete and how much they get paid, you know, to the white athlete. And I was going to, you know, come up with statistics about the white athlete in America gets paid 85 cents to the black athlete's dollar and to say, does that mean there's systematic institutional anti-white racism and professionals? I couldn't even do that though. Like I went to the NBA would be the obvious one because there's, there's quarterbacks that are white that get paid a bunch. Couldn't do that though, because the thing I looked at the particular year was like 2019 or something. I think the top 10 NBA athletes in terms of salary and endorsements were all black. So like I couldn't even, you know, I wasn't going to go get the whole league's roster just to uh, make my stupid point. But you get the idea, right? The fact that you can come up with these outcomes and show, oh, gee, in this group of people, if you just look at average salaries and then based on some particular dimension of their ethnicity or, or demographic identification, you can come up with a statement that people of this kind get paid a less amount per dollar of the other kind Therefore, the only explanation we can come up with or the go-to explanation is this must be systematic bigotry. There's plenty of context in which that's clearly stupid. Again, if you look at the NBA, clearly white people would get paid less than black people on average. And does that prove that all the NBA owners hate white people? Or No, of course not. Okay, the last thing I want to mention is these alleged programs or policies or attitudes towards fixing the problems of the past through, let's call reverse racism, not only is it harmful for the new victims, the people I'm going to say are the victims of it, it's also bad for the alleged beneficiaries, right? It's not helpful emotionally or in terms of your career. If you're taught from a young age, if you're, you know, black or a woman or Hispanic, what have you, it's not helpful if you're taught that, oh yeah, you've got the deck stacked against you and you know, no matter how hard you try, you're not going to be able to, that, that's not a good thing to be telling them. So yeah, you don't want to minimize what happens. You want them to know what's out there in the world, but it's just not useful emotionally to teach them that stuff. And then beyond that, something like affirmative action, here's the last point I'll make. Policies like affirmative action set minority students up for failure. So let's, if you go through like all of the students from undergrad and you figure out with a pure meritocracy, which in you know, the ones that are going to go to grad school, where would they end up? If you now have a policy that you take everybody and you bump them up one school, right, because of preferential treatment. So somebody who should have gone to a top 20 school instead ends up going to a top 10 school like that. If you do that systematically, that means every minority student is now in the deep end, in over his, head, his or her head. And they're going to have poor grades accordingly because they've all been bumped up into an environment where they are actually ill-equipped to compete. So in the long run, that's setting them up for failure. And of course, then you're going to explain to them, oh, the reason your GPA is lower is because all your professors are racist, as opposed to, yeah, because you should have been in a top 20 school, not a top 10 one. And we put you in here thinking we were doing you a favor. Okay, well, I'll wrap it up there. Thanks for listening, everybody. And I'll see you next time. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit BobMurphyShow.com.